In the third, fourth, and fifth episodes on anxiety, we're going to move away from the psychological and philosophical explorations of anxiety to the physiological processes underpinning this state. When trying to get to grips with anxiety, it's crucial to emphasize the importance of our body's physiology. The manipulation of our physical responses can have direct, immediate effects on our psychological experience. The separation of mind and body in discussions of anxiety well, is more conceptual than real, in that it's useful when explaining concepts to separate them. But in reality, the physical and psychological aspects of anxiety are deeply intertwined, making our exploration of the physiological processes not just relevant, but essential. Having touched on the conceptual underpinning, I'll then segue into introducing tools which leverage our knowledge of the body's physiological response to our advantage, appreciating that at times it's impossible to control the mind with the mind, so instead we engage the body. I'll also explain some longer term strategies in the case of chronic stress and associated anxiety, and then I'll finish off with pointing to the most effective evidence-based supplements. In previous episodes, we delved into the psychological and philosophical dimensions of stress, fear and anxiety also noting their distinct differences. However, in our physiological journey today, we will often refer to these states interchangeably. This is because from a physiological standpoint, the responses they elicit in the body share substantial overlap, making strict distinctions less necessary for our discussion. At the heart of the exploration into the physiology of anxiety, we can conceptualize the central nervous system really as being the scaffolding to what is a complex process. Composed of the brain and the spinal cord, it's what is responsible for the subjective feelings of distress, alongside the measurable physiological changes that frequently occur in a state of duress. Starting off with the brain, activity in certain discrete regions are pivotal in the context of anxiety. The first one being the amygdala, an almond shaped structure within the limbic system in our brain. The amygdala is often described as the alarm system. In this context, it has everything to do with threat detection and is exceptionally fast in processing sensory information that might signal danger. This rapid response capability bypasses the slower, more deliberate processing routes of the higher cortical areas. As well as this, it also factors into our processing of emotions. Through processes like fear conditioning, the amygdala learns from past experiences. It forms and recalls memories of what has previously been perceived as threatening and thereby more readily influences future responses to similar stimuli without the need for deliberate consideration. Deliberation which essentially takes time, time that may prove costly in a genuinely dangerous situation. When the amygdala detects a potential threat, it quickly initiates a stress response. The physiological consequences this may result in, such as increased heart rate, respiratory rate, and so on, will be described shortly. But specifically as it relates to the amygdala, its activation is directly related to the emotional component experienced during this state. The subjective feeling of fear and subsequent anxiety, although unpleasant, by nature is adaptive in that it maintains a state of heightened awareness and vigilance to our surrounding environment. Vigilance which ultimately results in shorter delays in reaction time to whatever may arise. Next, there's the prefrontal cortex. This is crucial for modulating the responses initiated by the amygdala. Its functions with regard to anxiety largely include the regulation and suppression of potentially inappropriate activity within our amygdala by a more considered evaluation of the current context. In the context of anxiety, it does this with the help of the hippocampus, a key brain region involved in the encoding, storage and retrieval of explicit memories. By balancing emotional and rational inputs based on the present situation and retrieval of associated memories, it determines whether to continue to engage this state of heightened arousal or to downregulate it in light of the contextual factors. This, as you can imagine, well, it's largely agreed upon that it's the weakened capability of both the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus to regulate inappropriate activation of the amygdala, which is the crux of the issue as it relates to persistent states of anxiety. As it relates to the hippocampus, abnormalities in this structure have been noted for individuals with higher trait anxiety. And to note this abnormality has been noted for individuals even before the well-documented effects that chronic stress and long-term exposure to cortisol has on the hippocampus. Without its valuable input, what ultimately occurs is a generalization of the fear response. Given the recall of explicit memories is impaired, our ability to differentiate contexts is too, and our anxiety therefore becomes a much more generalized, less targeted response to a broader range of scenarios. There's also strong evidence to suggest that for those with anxiety, overactivity of the amygdala is largely a consequence of less effective communication between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, leading to the continual activation of this brain region regardless of the context. Now, why am I telling you this? Besides the understanding that comes with it, 
how will it actually help? Well, when talking about the activity in particular brain regions, well, we're talking about the excitability of the neurons contained in them. And when we're talking about the excitability of neurons, we're now in the realm of neurotransmitters, as these directly alter the excitability of these neurons. So first, looking at the hyperactivity of the amygdala. Well, this is largely a consequence of decrease in GABA, which normally calms things down, and excess in glutamate, which, being excitatory, normally speeds things up. This understanding leads to why benzodiazepines, although their benefits are limited, well, they do work in that they increase effectiveness of GABA and thereby reducing the subjective experience of anxiety. It's also why the glutamate modulating agents are also being researched at the moment, as anxiety disorders are known to be associated with abnormally high levels of glutamate. And moving on to the prefrontal cortex, the neurotransmitter abnormalities that are largely responsible for the underactivity and subsequent inability to properly dampen the inappropriate anxious states. Well, in this region, the neurotransmitters that are thought to be most responsible for this are serotonin and norepinephrine. To remedy this, agents that aim to restore balance and subsequently restore this ability of the prefrontal cortex are the SSRIs and SNRIs, both classes of which we know are far from a cure, but do help in reducing states of anxiety, likely via this mechanism. These classes of medications also aim to reduce chronic stress responses, which well, they unfortunately are associated with an excess in both glutamate and cortisol levels, which have neurotoxic effects on a number of brain regions, but the one associated to the context of anxiety is the hippocampus. Excess levels in both cortisol and glutamate can lead to atrophy, in other words shrinkage, and further dysfunction in the hippocampus. Both SSRIs and SNRIs can stabilise the stress response and therefore indirectly help to stabilise function in this region. Most importantly at this point, as well as measuring perceived symptom reduction, it also informs us as to what behavioural and therapeutic approaches to take, and what it is that may or may not make them so effective. For instance, engaging in existential psychotherapy, aligning one's actions with personal value and unique sense of purpose, well it's well understood that this has everything to do with engaging areas of our brain involved in executive functioning, complex abstractions and cognitive reasoning. Specifically, research points to the activations of regions previously discussed that are underactive during states of anxiety, namely the prefrontal cortex and another region named the anterior cingulate cortex. Internally, we know the immediate effects of acting in a way which aligns with our purpose and values is that of less cognitive dissonance, more coherence, clarity, and a reduction of indiscriminate anxiety. Over time, however, repeated activation of these brain regions through consistent value-driven behavior leads to neuroplastic changes. These include increased cortical thickness and improved connectivity within these key frontal regions, which for so long have become somewhat inactive during states in which their input was very much needed. The long-term effects of the structural and functional enhancements, well, they're substantial. Individuals experience sustained reductions in anxiety and improvements in overall mental well-being. These improvements are underpinned by a more robust and efficient neural architecture in areas critical for more objectively processing and regulating our emotional states. The same benefits are seen too with other therapeutic modalities, an obvious example being CBT, which, and I would say for rather questionable reasons, has certainly had more funding put into the research of it. Regardless, this same increase in structural and functional changes within the prefrontal regions have also been demonstrated an increased functional connectivity between these regions and the amygdala, and a reduction in activity in the amygdala largely deemed to be responsible for the subjective experience of anxious states. And although in my view slightly messy, the research on mindfulness points to exactly the same effects, which makes absolute sense given the nature of mindfulness practice and the changes you begin to notice internally when regularly practicing for a prolonged amount of time. Interestingly, regular mindfulness meditation is also strongly associated to increase grey matter density, i.e. structural connectivity, within the hippocampus, another region previously discussed as a contributor to states of inappropriate anxiety. This is likely due to a reduction in inflammatory markers and cortisol levels that have been demonstrated after diligently practicing this skill, both of which, when raised, have neurotoxic effects, especially to this particular brain region. And lastly, not forgetting exercise. It's obvious to suggest now that exercise is indeed a fundamental player in the maintenance of good health, but it's sometimes satisfying to know what exactly makes this so. We're all, I'm sure, 
well aware of the general improvement in mood that comes after exercising, whether sport, a run, or even weight training. I'm sure we're also aware of what might cause this. Specifically, this is an upsurge of dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, as well as that ominous thing that we call endorphins. Endorphins are just peptides that get released after we exercise that work as neurotransmitters binding to opioid receptors. Funnily enough, endorphin just stands for endogenous, referring to from within, and morphine, which, well, I'm sure we've heard of due to its euphoric and addictive effects. And funnily enough, morphine is named after Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. Anyway, I digress. But basically, endorphins are known for their euphoric effects, giving rise to what is known as the runner's high, but also a distinct reduction in pain sensitivity. And these effects are not just short living. Regular exercise increases baseline levels of these key neurotransmitters, increases the number and density of the receptors of these neurotransmitters, promotes neuroplasticity specifically in the aforementioned areas of the hippocampus and cortical regions, thought to be as a result of release of growth factors and a reduction in inflammatory states. This has a corresponding effect of both elevation of positive emotions, regulation of mood states, cognitive enhancement, measurable improvements to the encoding, storage and retrieval of memory. It increases pain resilience and the list goes on. The last bit of practical advice I want to finish on relates to the importance of voluntary exposure to stressors. In the next episode, I'll detail the physiological effects of anxiety, which is largely mediated by arousal of the autonomic nervous system. I'll also list techniques which look to counteract this largely uncomfortable state of physical unrest that comes when anxiety experienced is inappropriate. This state of physiological arousal, i.e. the state in which your body is in a state of overdrive, where it feels as if your heart is pumping out your chest, you can't stop your hands tremoring, you're gasping for breath, or even sweating profusely, well, this state doesn't dissipate immediately. So therefore, mastering the ability to, in simple terms, weather the storm, well, this becomes crucial. This involves maintaining composure, even when your body may be in a state of panic, seemingly acting independently of your control. The importance of this skill lies in its utility during episodes of inappropriate anxiety, where there's a pronounced discrepancy between your physiological arousal and the relative calm of your environment. In scenarios where anxiety is appropriate, such as an adaptive response to a stressful situation, well here the unity of body and mind is beneficial and can aid in navigating challenging environments. However, when dealing with inappropriate anxiety, it's critical to appreciate the misalignment between your heightened physiological state and the non-threatening nature of your surroundings. Training the mind to remain calm during physiological stress. This voluntary exposure to stresses well, it's essentially about practicing and reinforcing the separation between mind and body, which, well, is an indispensable tool for those who frequently experience anxiety, which is inappropriate and unwarranted. Through voluntary exposure, one deliberately engages in situations that precipitate stress and the subsequent surge of cortisol and adrenaline. This method differs markedly from strategies that seek to unify mind and body. Instead, it focuses on their deliberate dissociation by intentionally inducing physiological stress, marked by any voluntary activity that temporarily raises heart rate, respiratory rate, and so on. We train the mind to maintain tranquility, cognitively and emotionally, despite the body's heightened state. This practice is not about achieving unity between mind and body, but rather fostering their dissociation during times of arousal. This arousal can be triggered by any activity that elicits this acute stress response, and a raised heart rate is a pretty simple measure of whether the activity does this. Examples would include intense physical exercise or even cold exposure. This method of exposure, coupled with the disciplined maintenance of mental calmness, enhances our ability to manage stress in future situations. Essentially, through repeated practice, we can significantly increase our threshold for perceived stress. And this isn't just conjecture. What I'm speaking of here is what is well documented and what is often referred to as stress inoculation. This method has been used in military training programs and for professional athletes for centuries, but its benefits extend to us all, especially those experiencing the debilitating effects of anxiety on a daily basis. That about sums up the episode for now. I hope this has been of some benefit, and please don't forget to give this a rating and share to others if so. It really does go a long way. And as always, thank you so much for listening.